This is the MacBook Pro M4 Pro, and this is really the upgrade that the M3 Pro should have been. While it looks almost identical to the previous generation, there are a bunch of updates in here that make this version quite an improvement over the M3 Pro MacBook. And in my opinion, the M4 Pro really feels like a much more polished laptop. A lot of that is to do with performance. I've been testing out everything that I can on the M4 Pro and using it within my own workflow, and there are noticeable gains in a variety of places, but there are also some things that sit outside of that that I've been super impressed with, and today I'm gonna dive into all of that. So if you're considering picking up the latest M4 Pro machine, or you're wondering if it's worth the upgrade over an older model, stick around and let's get into it. Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. Last year when the M3 Pro MacBook Pro came out, it sort of felt like a mixed bag when comparing it to the models that came before it. On one hand, you saw pretty big gains in performance, especially on the GPU with the introduction of hardware-enabled ray tracing. But on the other, things that seemed like they should have improved seemed somewhat stagnant or even regressed in some areas. The memory bandwidth and performance cores dropped, battery performance was largely the same, even though it should have been a more efficient chipset, and it almost felt like things were half finished, but this year that couldn't be further from the truth. The MacBook Pro that I have here is the base M4 Pro model, so it's got a 12 core CPU, 16 core GPU, 24 gigs of RAM, and a 512 gig SSD, which right off the hop, on paper gives you a lot more than the base version from last year for the same price, and digging into the details further, it gets even better. While you do get an extra CPU core on the base versions, the amount of performance cores was drastically increased, going from 5 in the M3 Pro base to 8 in the base M4 Pro, which is a huge deal for some apps that run almost exclusively off the performance cores. We saw this last year in audio production apps or DAWs where people were having a lot of issues with the M3 Pro running slower than the models before it, and admittedly I'm no expert in the ins and outs of audio production, but in the few tools that I use, the M4 Pro has been notably faster than the M3 Pro. In Logic Pro, my audio clips generally render out about 14% faster on average over the M3 Pro, and overall things feel a lot smoother when I add and edit tracks with a bunch of plugins and effects, and that carries over to other areas as well. In Geekbench, the M4 Pro is about 18% faster than the M3 Pro base or 32% faster than the M2 Pro with multi-core being 29% faster than the M3 Pro and 39% faster than the base M2 Pro, which is kind of wild considering that they're less than two years apart in their release date. Similarly, you see about a 28% increase in GPU scores going from the base M3 Pro to the M4 Pro, and I think these are all notable spec bumps, especially since these are only a year apart, but how does that translate into real-world use? Well, for most things, you're not going to notice a huge difference if all you're doing is everyday tasks, say things like productivity software, web browsing, consuming media, those kinds of things. Even things like basic photo editing, graphic design, and coding on small projects aren't going to feel much different than the models before or below this. And frankly, you could easily get by on a base M4 machine for most of those tasks. I'm going to dive into the base M4 chip next week, so make sure that you're subscribed if you want to check that out, but it's when we get into the more resource intensive stuff that the M4 Pro makes a big difference. Part of that is because not only do we have an extra 6 gigs of RAM in the base version, but it also runs at a much higher bandwidth of 274 gigabytes per second over 150 in the M3 Pro or 200 in the M2 Pro, which is a significant increase. That means in apps like Blender, I can safely bump up the memory allocation a bit, but even when they're set to the same value between machines, renders are around 39-40% to 40 faster than the M3 Pro, which is pretty crazy, and things overall just generally feel a lot smoother with any kind of GPU-heavy or 3D work. Gaming is also pretty smooth, considering this isn't a gaming machine, where the few titles that I do have that are compatible with macOS run at pretty high frame rates and are extremely playable. When you move over to video editing, that's a similar story, where again, the M4 Pro MacBook just feels a lot smoother moving around and doing things. 
especially with resource heavy plugins. And it also renders out video around 13% faster than the M3 Pro. I kind of touched on this last week, but I'm a little surprised that rendering performance is any different, given that it's usually limited to the encoding and decoding engines, where that has stayed largely the same between each generation, but there does seem to be some improvements there, but predictably is exactly the same between this base 12-core M4 Pro chip and the 14-core one that I've got in my Mac Mini. On that note, for anyone who is wondering if the upgrade to that 14 core chip is worth it, which will cost you an extra $200 USD, that likely really depends on what you're doing, but in a general sense, I don't think you're missing out on too much there. Performance outside of rendering video is only slightly better across the board, where you see about a 9 to 12% increase regardless of the metric, which in most cases generally isn't perceivable, and I honestly think that I'd rather bump up the storage to one terabyte, which is about the same cost. The base config gives you 512 gigs of storage, which is a fair amount, but if you have a lot of larger files, or say if you're a mobile developer running a bunch of emulators or simulators or whatever the case may be, that can fill up pretty quickly and the one terabyte drive does run a bit faster as well. You'll have the same read speed between the 512 gig and one terabyte drives, but the one terabyte drive has about twice as fast write speed, which I suppose is notable, but Again, actually using the thing, those speeds likely won't ever be a bottleneck either way, and my preference there would be mostly due to the storage not being upgradable, unless you're using something like an external SSD, which also just became a lot more viable option as well. For the past 8 or 9 years, Apple has been running USB-C ports with Thunderbolt 3 or 4 that have a max transfer speed of 40 gigabits per second, but New this year is the introduction of Thunderbolt 5 that can potentially reach between 80 and 120 gigabits per second, which is a huge step forward. That means external drives with Thunderbolt 5 will be able to run just as fast or faster in some cases than the internal ones, and with things like hubs and docks, there is a high probability that you'll see less of a drop off in speed connecting Thunderbolt 4 accessories like you see on some current Thunderbolt 4 docks. That increase in speed will also be great for working with super large files or libraries between machines, and I do have some Thunderbolt 5 gear on the way. I'm just not entirely sure when that'll show up, and I am really looking forward to testing it out, but we're still very much in the early days of Thunderbolt 5, and I would say that right now that spec is more about future-proofing yourself than anything. Now up to this point, performance-wise, everything in the M4 Pro MacBook has been pretty impressive, but the thing that I've been noticing on this machine that I thought should have been improved on the M3 Pro but wasn't is the battery life. The reason why I say that is because last year Apple went from a 5 nanometer process in the M2 chip to 3 nanometers in the M3, which means the components are much smaller and usually translates into better power efficiency and battery life, but we really didn't see any change in battery life on the M3 MacBooks. I'm not sure if that's because the M3 was just a stopgap solution to get on the 3 nanometer process or what, but Apple says that you can get up to 22 hours of battery life on the M4 Pro versus 18 in the M3 Pro, and I can definitely feel the difference having used it over the last two weeks in the right circumstances. If I start my day out at 100% battery on the M4 Pro, I can do a combination of web browsing, productivity, and heavier things like 3D modeling or video editing, and it carries well into the next day no problem. If I'm mostly sticking to lighter tasks, it definitely lasts longer than the M3 Pro, but with heavier workloads it will go through the battery a little faster than the M3 Pro because of the extra performance cores, which I think is a fair trade-off, and heat performance is a little bit worse on the M4 Pro. They'll both reach about the same internal temperature, but the M4 Pro heats up faster, which kicks on the fans more often, but it does have a much higher level of performance at peak temperature, which is nice to see, and beyond that, the only other time you see a big power draw is if you connect power hungry accessories or you crank up the brightness levels on the display, which I should mention has changed a little bit as well. The M4 Pro display will get slightly brighter this year in SDR content, going from 600 nits to 1000 nits at max brightness. 
Just be aware that it'll only get to that brightness level if you're outdoors, and I'm not entirely sure how Apple judges when they kick that on, but having measured this a bunch over the last week, most of the time that's going to go up to 600, just like the last generation, but there is one other minor update here. Apple seems to have switched the panel type to a quantum dot display as opposed to the KSF ones in years past. That could potentially add to the overall efficiency, color gamut, and motion performance, and I noticed something pop up during testing that I did wonder about there. This is a mini LED display, but on a lot of quantum dot OLED screens, you see almost a gray hue over the blacks when the panels are in bright areas, and the first thing that I noticed when testing each display is that the contrast on the M4 Pro wasn't quite as good as the M3 Pro at higher brightness values. After seeing those numbers, I've been testing this out in a bunch of different environments, trying to see if that visually makes a difference, but in large part, it's relatively the same. And when it comes to color accuracy and the overall picture, it's virtually identical to the previous ProMotion XDR displays. It's great for watching content, doing any color critical work, and because it is a higher refresh rate, Everything is super smooth, and you might also notice that there is a glossy finish on this particular MacBook, where you do also have the option of getting a nano texture now for an extra 150 bucks, which I'm honestly not a huge fan of. Don't get me wrong, nano texture is great if you're worried about reflections a lot, and that's something that you're dealing with on a regular basis but it also makes the picture a little bit softer, and you do get kind of a speckled RGB look over white content, which I don't particularly like, where a glossy finish is just a lot sharper and cleaner in my opinion. Right above the display you have the new webcam with center stage, which in everyday usage doesn't look a whole lot different than the last generation. It is a bit better overall if you're pixel peeping, and you do have the new desk view feature, which I find more gimmicky than anything, where it'll show you a top-down shot in front of your desk if you want to show something off. Outside that, it looks almost identical, it has the exact same form factor, it's the same weight, and the only thing that I can notice a slight difference in is the finish or sheen on the MacBook is just a hair more flat, where the M3 Pro version has more of a shimmer to it, but you really need to have them side by side to notice it. That being said, while these two do look the same, there's obviously a lot more going on under the hood, and you'll definitely be getting a lot more value in these base versions than you ever have previously with the increase in available memory, performance, and battery life. I know I can easily run my entire workflow from this thing for making these videos. I can hop into a software project and start coding if I want, or do 3D work without ever really having to worry about things. So. If you're wondering if it's worth an upgrade from a Mac that's maybe even only a couple years old now, I think there are definitely a few things that you'll probably notice at least that makes it a noticeable upgrade for you. Like I said, next week I'm gonna pop over to a base M4 machine where I'm gonna run a lot of these same tests and find out just how much you can get out of that chip. But if you have any questions or comments on the M4 Pro machines, drop those in the comments down below. If you found this video useful or enjoyable, feel free to hit that like button. If you'd like to see more tech-related content or help me create an app that switches your cursor to different food types every 20 minutes, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next upload.